Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. You may be aware that I recently visited Valve, and there was a purpose behind that. It wasn't certainly for some sort of fluffy studio tour. No, no, it was for a day of meetings with myself, Jenna, and Jim Sterling, alongside some of the senior folks in Valve, including Robin Walker, who you may be familiar with. I'm going to use this video to tell you all about it. Now, first things first, we were not put under any sort of NDA, that's a non-disclosure agreement, meaning that we can talk about everything we saw there. That said, it's worth bearing in mind that the stuff that we discussed and saw is in various states of either concept or development, meaning that we have no timeline on it, and of course we have no idea what the final form of any of this is going to be. So if that stuff doesn't pop up within a month and isn't exactly the same as what I described in this video, then don't be too surprised. This is Valve after all, we don't exactly know how long it's going to take. They did state, however, they want some of this functionality ready for the Steam Direct launch. As to when that's going to be, again, couldn't tell you. The one other thing to bear in mind is that there's not really going to be a lot of relevant video in the background of this. There's really nothing that I can put there that would be useful for the most part, so... Feel free to minimize, I'll just put some stock footage of terrible video games from Jim Sterling's channel in there. However, there will be occasionally a point where I want to show you a few things, particularly regarding the Steam Curator system. When that happens, I will say, hey, you can refer to the screen right now, so you don't have to worry about staring like a hawk at this thing, wondering whether something relevant is going to pop up. I think you're probably pretty familiar with that style of viewing. Our videos are more like podcasts than anything else, so... It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if you've already minimized. Good for you. You should have. All right. So let's begin. Why was I there in the first place? Well, for the last few months, I've been in contact with various people at Valve. They reached out to me and they wanted to have some conversations. The topics of discussion were Steam Direct, Steam Curation, and the current state of the store. It also included some ideas for new features and programs, which I'll get onto a little bit later. And they wanted help in improving all of these systems and getting our feedback and consultation on it. Particularly in terms of curators, the system has barely been updated over the last few years and is in dire need of functionality. And a lot of the large curators really have abandoned their posts simply because they don't view the system as worthwhile for them anymore. Now, you yourself may not care about curators, and I don't necessarily blame you. Valve's really given you no reason to over the last few years. However, Valve does view curators as part of the solution to the problem of a store that is wide open for terrible video games. They want curators to be part of that solution and make sure that it's good, interesting, and relevant games popping up in front of you as opposed to bad ones. And of course, that's in their vested interests. You might think, well, I don't really care because they're selling games regardless. Yeah, but they're making profit from good games and selling the right games to you. A satisfied customer is more likely to come back and buy more from that store. They don't want to keep showing you bad stuff because that will drive you away from the store. You will purchase less. And how is that good for them? Of course, it is not. They want to make Steam better for good games and, of course, for the developers that make them let people find them easier, and they also want to kill off bad games essentially by making them invisible. Now you might ask, well, how exactly do they intend to do that? Who is the arbiter of what is a bad game and what is a good game? And is there a distinction between a good game, a bad game, and a game that isn't a game? A game that is an asset flip, a game that barely exists, a game that is essentially a scam? Well, Valve, as it turns out, does make a distinction between these three things. They, in fact, call these scam games fake games. And later on, I'll be telling you exactly what they intend to do about those things. Now, let's get on to the first topic of discussion. And the reason that I'm bringing this up first is that it was underpinning everything else that we talked about. This was something that we weren't expecting, it didn't come up in the conversations prior to entering the office, but makes a lot of sense in the context of everything else. Now, Valve is currently of the belief that their discovery system is working relatively well. There are obviously improvements that can be made, which is why we were there in the first place. But they believe, for the most part, that the discovery queue on Steam is showing people stuff they may very well be interested in. This is, of course, including things like the carousel at the top of the screen. This includes games that were recommended due to you playing games with certain tags attached to them because they were recommended by certain curators or because a lot of your friends were playing them. 
as well as the actual discovery queue, which is a little bit further down. They think that this is working relatively well. However, what they want to do is make sure that you know exactly why something appeared in your discovery queue, in the top carousel, or essentially anywhere on Steam. They want you to have a good set of reasons for that. At the moment, the way they plan on doing this is by throwing open the doors to big data. The data that they have collected, the data they have access to on every game on Steam, they want you to be able to see it. Now, this is not, by the sounds of it, going to include sales figures. They want to focus on the data that is relevant to you as to why you saw or didn't see a particular game. Data such as where exactly did the impressions for this page come from and how many impressions did the page get. They want to be able to show that bad games are not actually clogging up the Steam store page. They want to show that these terrible games are not getting any attention and any attention that they do get is actually coming from external sources such as videos showing them or tweets or reddit posts laughing at them. They want to try and prove that the Steam store is actually not infested with terrible titles and if these really bad games are getting attention on the Steam store they want to be able to deal with that as a result of showing this data to everybody. It's a bit of a crowdsourcing system, I suppose. If a terrible game starts popping up on the Steam store, you'll be able to visit this page to figure out exactly why. Why is it getting its impressions? Why did it end up on the Steam page? If it was recommended to you, why did that happen? And if there's a problem with their data system and their recommendation engine, they can then go on and fix it. They want this real-time data out there so it can be analyzed by anybody that feels like it and so they can make ongoing changes to reach the end goal that everybody's Steam page looks different but is personalized perfectly to them based on the data that they have. This means in theory that you should, if the system works perfectly, never see a game you're not interested in ever again. In theory. That's a tall order, as you might imagine. In theory versus in practice, getting a recommendation engine that is data-driven that is that accurate to a person that often doesn't even know what they want themselves is a huge challenge. And I would imagine that they're not going to be able to pull that off to a perfect degree at any point. I would imagine they're still going to run into mistakes. But the interesting thing about data-driven algorithms and looking at consumer behavior is that in some cases you can predict things that they might like that they haven't even thought of yet. And that to me is a good recommendation engine because at that point the platform becomes a tastemaker and it allows gamers to experience and discover titles that they otherwise wouldn't have thought of themselves. It lets them broaden their horizons and potentially experience games that are outside of their particular comfort zone. And I say their comfort zone because in reality, most consumers believe they are far pickier and far more discerning than they really are. It goes back to what a lot of you were told as children, myself included. How do you know you don't like it if you've never tried it? It applies to pretty much every walk of life. Most people, if given exposure to things that they believe they won't like, may very well find something that they do. Which is, as far as I'm concerned, a good thing. And their recommendation engine is aiming to do that. That, again, is an extremely difficult task, and I imagine it's certainly not going to be perfect. What's important is making sure that people know why they were recommended something. And they showed us a mock-up of a page which should, in theory, tell people exactly why they found themselves on a particular store page. This mock-up featured a whole breakout box of reasons as to why you found yourself there. It's like, well, you played these games in the past, which are similar to this one. You played games involving these tags, and this game also has these tags. Your friends played these games, and your friends rated these games particularly highly. This game is ranked number eight in a certain genre that you enjoy. This is happening to a much lesser extent right now. If you head on up to the Steam Carousel, and I'll show you this on the screen right now, 
These are some of the recommendations that I get in my carousel, and for the most part, they're recommended based on shared tags, and occasionally I'll get one recommended due to a curator that I follow. The problem with this system is that it doesn't really take into account game quality, and you often get recommended things simply on the basis of tags, when there's no way in a million years that you would actually play that because it looks completely and totally awful. So if you take more data and you give it to the user and you compile all that data together and make recommendations based on a larger amount of data than is currently being used, then hopefully you get more accurate recommendations and the user is made completely aware as to why they were given this information. It is, for all intents and purposes, a strategy of transparency. I'm always going to be in favor of that because it's pro-consumer. So that's the whole point of them giving you all of this data. It's going to be a data overload for the vast majority of people, but it's going to throw open the doors to a lot of analysis from people that know what they're talking about, which means that we have less question marks in the formula. We are able to figure out exactly why Steam is doing things that it's doing, and then we can go back to Valve and say, look, this is clearly broken and they can hopefully fix it. So that's what led off the discussions, and everything else that we talked about has some element of this in it, because all of this is associated with the idea of data-driven recommendations and figuring out what you like so that they can show you things that you'll like and make sure that things that you don't like will be invisible to you. Everybody's Steam page should look different. They already do. They're looking to push that really even further. And two things that they wanted to discuss to assist in that were an improved curator system and something new, something that you haven't heard of before, which is currently in concept and that they're calling Steam Explorers. So let me tell you about that first. Steam Explorers it will be a program that you are able to sign up to. You have to opt into it. And if you sign up to be a Steam Explorer, you'll be shown an exploration list of games that fit certain criteria. And the criteria is a little different to a regular discovery list. More often than not, these will be games that failed to reach a certain cap of exposure within their first couple of weeks of sale. So the point of this is to be a system which allows people to dig out hidden gems, which allows people to make sure that games that should probably deserve more exposure than they're getting actually get their time in the sun directly through the Steam client. So what you're going to get is this list based on your user habits, based on tags that you select, and you will be able to buy those games and then assess them. They haven't determined exactly what they're going to do with the assessment yet. They're thinking about giving you some sort of survey at the end of a certain amount of playtime. And of course, they will take into account bits of data, like how much of the game you actually did play and what kind of sitting and all that sort of thing, and then compare it to games that you've played before. Now, you will have to pay for these games, which I know is going to elicit a groan out of you. However, they do want to provide perks, and one of them that they're thinking about at the moment is that once a week you'll be able to do a no-strings-attached refund, regardless of how much time you've spent in the game. So, yeah, you're putting up your money, but let's say you did one of these a week, you can get that money back, no questions asked, no strings attached is not going to count towards the number of refunds that you would regularly be limited to. And of course, there is always the possibility that Valve can and will cut you off at pretty much any time. And even if you spent 10 hours in this game, yes, you can get your money back no problem at all. So you're getting a free review copy of sorts, even though you are not a professional reviewer. You get to do the same thing that a professional reviewer would do. Now, we also suggested various improvements and rewards to this, which included badges, of course, and little perks that would apply to your account. This would include access to an exclusive set of forums for Steam Explorers, which would, of course, be properly moderated. They would hopefully be a pleasant place to interact with people, to discuss various titles, and engage in multiplayer gaming for games that perhaps don't have large player bases. We're going to be based around the idea of a book club. So you would be able to bring a title and say, Hey guys, you know, I discovered this title. It's great. Maybe you haven't heard of it. Maybe you'd like to check it out. And then hopefully some of these other guys check it out and say, Yeah, that was great. And have a meaningful and hopefully enjoyable discussion about the whole thing. Valve's opinion, and that's an opinion I tend to agree with, is the sort of person that would engage in Steam Explorer activities 
is different to your average user. They're looking for something new, they're looking for something out of the ordinary, they're looking to dig up a hidden gem as it were, and as a result, if you group those people together, you'll hopefully have some really cool discussions and create a system that is not readily exploitable for free stuff. Obviously, since you're doing something that will benefit the system, you should be rewarded for it, but they don't want to make it something that could be easily abused. Games flagged by explorers as worth your time and good will get pushed into more discovery lists, they'll hopefully get more front page attention, and all of that exploration is going to be based on tags that you select, your previous gaming preferences, and all that sort of thing. So, you're not going to be recommended a flight sim if the only thing you play is first person shooter and fighting games. Interesting little system, we'll have to see whether or not they're able to properly incentivize people to use it. If you think back, this is what they hoped people would do with Steam Greenlight. But of course, there was no incentive for them to do that, so the usage dropped off. They admitted to us that quite early on, they realized Steam Greenlight wasn't going to work. And they've been gradually working towards a replacement for it. They knew that interest and engagement would fall off. They weren't quite aware as to how corrupt the system would become with these little companies and groups set up to specifically game the system to get absolute nonsense onto the Steam store, but they were aware that it was a system that wasn't going to work long term, which is why they're working towards this whole Steam Direct thing. Now, moving on to curators. This was kind of my area of specialty. As it stands from my perspective, curators are currently useless. And it simply comes down to the fact that we don't have enough tools to do our jobs properly, and we only get shown to those that follow us in the first place. Now, I understand that some people don't want to see recommendations from people they don't follow. Some people might do it due to personal dislike of that person, or simply because they just don't want that stuff popping up on their front page. Now, as you might imagine, as a curator, I do disagree with that to some extent. I think that if you're going to have, say, box quotes on a Steam Store page, then having curator information there is also important. And it's not like I get to choose which box quotes I read. I look at the Talos principle, I see recommendations from GameSpot and PC World. Now, I don't generally read anything the PC World's got to say. I don't really see why that should be there. I don't get the opportunity to get rid of that, but it is what it is. The problem that curators currently have in terms of being useful to people that don't follow them is that if you don't follow any curators, then curator presence on Steam is essentially zero. If I didn't follow a curator and then went to the page for Talos Principle, I wouldn't see anything about curators at all. And it would be good if I did. Because, yes, it's going to show me some different opinions on the title, and it's going to show me some curators that might have some interesting things to say. And the problem with the system at the moment is that if you don't know it's there, you're not going to engage with it. And if people aren't engaging with it, it can't be useful. So I made some suggestions in regards to that. I think that even if you're not following any curators, there should be at least a button somewhere on that page that says, See what curators have to say about this. Maybe it could be a hover over so that you don't even have to see those terrible little words that you don't want to read unless you actively go there to read them. Something along those lines at any rate. It's just one of the many problems that the curator system has at the moment in the sense that it can't be useful if people aren't using it, if people aren't engaging with it. Now, they want to make it more useful. They want to increase the functionality that we have available to us and make curation a rewarding and useful experience. Now, I can spend a lot of time doing the whole indoor rounders thing, talking about all the little things in the back end that are broken, but frankly, you don't really care about that. I'll show you a wee bit of it, but I'm going to focus mostly on what you as the consumer really care about, which is what can curators do for you? How can curators let you find better games, avoid games that suck, and make your Steam Store page a more useful and easier experience? Well, as it stands, they can't really do an awful lot unless you follow them. And in terms of a system to allow you to discover new games, it's very, very limited. Curator recommendations will pop up about halfway down the Steam Store page, but if you want to go and look at a curator's overall database, it's actually not easy to do at all. Let me give you an example by heading on over to my own curator page. This page to you as a consumer is basically useless. Unless you are looking for recommendations of very recent games, you are not going to find an awful lot of value here. 
Half the page is completely wasted space, as you can see. At the top of the page is just a big splash for my most recently recommended game. That's completely useless to you. If you scroll down, you'll see recent reviews, top sellers, and new releases. The problem is you have very little means of sorting through this, searching it, or breaking it down by useful information like tags. If you look at the side there, you see the filter system. It's barely worth anything. Look at the categories that you can filter by. Single player, multiplayer, co-op, and MMO. You can't even filter by genre. You certainly can't filter by tag. Narrowing by features. Who filters by Steam achievements? I mean, really. Who filters by trading cards or workshop support or Steam cloud support? Nobody does these things. It's indicative that the system was built by people that don't regularly use it themselves. Otherwise, they immediately realize that people who are looking to use the curator system to discover new stuff don't find any of this useful. What you actually want is the ability to break down and search this page by tag. Let's say I follow Total Biscuit, who I know really likes the spectacle fighter or character action genre. I want to break down his list by recommended available PC spectacle fighter and character action games. How do I do it? I can't. It is impossible. There is no search box that will work with the curator system. There are no tags. There aren't even any genres. I can't even select action, which is in itself an utterly useless genre because it covers far too many games. So... Me knowing what this curator happens to specialize in, I can't use it to the best of its potential. It's the same with, say, going to a curator that specializes in space sims or 4x strategy or fighting games or anything along those lines. Because, of course, they're going to put other games in there unless they are specifically a curator just for that genre. This makes these general curators, even the ones with a lot of followers, very much useless. Now, a way that I suggested to improve this was to use the tag system, but not only use the regular in-Steam tag system, but provide a tag cloud within a tag cloud. A tag cloud that would be applicable solely to that particular curator. Here's an example of why that might be useful. There may very well be a description that I use for a game that isn't commonly used. Let's say roguelite, for instance. That's a term that I use an awful lot. Now, this tag does exist within Steam. It's just not a particularly big tag. In fact, the most used tag is roguelike, which I specifically disagree with. If I search for roguelite, it brings up some games that I would define as roguelite titles, yes. But most of those games are tagged primarily with roguelike, which I fundamentally disagree with, and people know that because I believe that roguelike is a very specific subgenre, and most of the games in this list don't fulfill the necessary requirements for it. So those that watch me follow my curator and think the same way that I do in that respect, they're not going to want stuff like Nuclear Throne to pop up in roguelike because they don't believe that that game is a roguelike. They'd want it to pop up in roguelite as a priority. And I would be able to create my own internal tag cloud in the curator system describing that game as a roguelite. And that would be a priority tag when it comes to searching my curator for people that use that curator themselves. Now, of course, that would also influence the overall Steam tag cloud, but nowhere near as much. The priority would be on the tags that I had applied in my curator page instead of the popular tags, the tags that had been used by a lot of people in the general Steam ecosystem. So you take those curator pages and you sort of make them their own little ecosystem within an ecosystem, which I believe would be far more useful for those that are using the curator pages to find specific things and have very specific preferences based on which curators they followed. Right now, tags are nigh on useless within the curator system, in any respect, because you simply can't search a curator using tags. So that to me seems like a ridiculous missed opportunity and something that they're looking into changing. It goes beyond the functionality on this page when it comes to filtering. It comes down to what I can choose to show you. I can't curate my own curator page. Let's say, for instance, I wanted to show you my top 10 games of 2016. I wanted to put them all in a nice little box and put them right at the top of the page so you can see them instantly. I can't do it. Let's say I wanted to show you my top 10 RTS of all time available on Steam. I can't do it. 
Now, thankfully, this is something that Valve showed us in the mock-ups. They want us to be able to put games into what I would describe as buckets. You can choose various games from within your curator and create a collection with them and throw them on the page in any order you so desire. And of course, you could change this on a regular basis. This would allow you to do useful things like, say, create a collection of curated games, that's really hard to say, that are currently on a Steam sale. I mean, a lot of this can be done automatically, and at some point, you do get those recommendations on the front page if you know where to look. But on a curator page, you would be able to not only have those show up automatically, it's like, hey, these games on this curator list are currently on sale. You can see them right here in an easy list. But also, create your own custom sales recommendation lists. These are all things that make this page worth viewing and worth coming back to. Not only that, but they're looking at things like social and information feed integration. That doesn't mean you're going to be spammed with Facebook and Twitter posts. It means that we'll be able to use these pages to directly deliver information to you beyond simply using the Steam groups in the way that we currently do. A lot of you are signed up to Steam groups just because you have to be in order to follow a particular curator. The thing is, these are two completely separate systems as far as I'm concerned. And while there is a degree of crossover, it seems that making the curator system something that you can use without joining one of these groups would be a useful tool, and being able to post information directly to the curator page rather than relying on a secondary group is far more helpful. We communicated this to them, and they seem to be very receptive to it. They're also looking to put in a lot of nice quality of life improvements for you, the consumer, for instance, allowing you to immediately play one of our WTFS videos directly from the curator page. Say you see something on the curator page, say, oh, that looks good. You can immediately play the video for that game straight up for those who happen to, of course, be doing written reviews. Well, you can already click read the full review, but you can have a preview window that pops up that would immediately show you part of that review in the Steam client without you having ever having to leave it. That is very useful. Now, when it comes to stuff in the back end, they have already asked me to send a laundry list of stuff that I want fixing. <laughs> and oh god, there is a lot of stuff I want fixing. This may not be relevant to most of you, but I'm hoping that getting a lot of this stuff fixed will actually encourage you to maybe set up your own curator and actually start doing this sort of stuff yourself. Because the more curators we have on Steam, especially since they intend to give them far more influence over things like discovery queues and what appears on the front page, the better the Steam store is going to be. And that is a way for you to get your voice heard. Now, if you don't already use the curator system because you don't think anyone's going to care or it's a pain in the ass, well, I don't really blame you, but you're going to hear a little bit later on about incentives to use this system. Now, one of these incentives, of course, is fixing all of the stuff that makes it infuriating to use. I'm going to spend a brief amount of time talking about a few of those things through my experience as the top curator on Steam. So this is what the curator backend looks like. Have a look on the screen right now. This is relevant. And you're going to see my tagline, which I can edit. My curator group description, which I can't edit. Yeah, that doesn't make any damn sense. And a list of the stuff that I have recently, quote, reviewed. Not a title I would use, but that's something they're also going to be changing. I pointed out that for the last three years, people have been asked to read the full review on my YouTube page, <laughs> which is ridiculous. They're going to get onto that. Now, the only options I really have here are create new review, stop following my own curator, why would I want this, and a small amount of statistical information. I know nothing really about how influential this curator is and how useful it is. This is all information that through their big data transparency push, they're going to give us. So you as a curator will be able to see, hey, I was able to drive X number of people to these particular games. And you might think, well, that's not important. I disagree. I think motivating curators to be forces for good within the Steam system, whether it be through making sure that bad games are not recommended or even just information given to the consumer is a big motivating factor because the kind of person that would curate in the first place is the kind of person that wants to make a change, that wants to influence. And we have no information as to how useful we are. And I'm going to assume at the moment, we're not particularly useful whatsoever. So all that data is going to be here, whereas right now all we see are reviews and followers, which are frankly useless. Now, 
Creating a new curation entry is fairly easy, but editing an existing one isn't. Let me show you how jank this goddamn thing is. So you might think that on this page there would be an edit button to immediately add new information, or indeed remove something from my curation page. There isn't! You can see it right here, there's no edit button. If I want to actually edit this, I have to click the icon for the game, and then click edit this review or delete this review. I mean, this is two more clicks than is justifiable. Not only that, but if I want to look at the comments, I don't know why I would, but if I want to look at the comments on my recommendation, I have to also click through there. All of this should be inline and easy to access, and it gets inevitably worse when I'm trying to edit something that's old. As you can see, I've got 10 recommendations on this page. What about if I want to change something from, say, a couple of years ago? Maybe it just got a recent patch. Well, I can't do that. I have to dig through and try and find this damn thing. There's no search functionality. They recently implemented the ability to select recommend, not recommend, or informational. So you can actually put something in your curator that isn't a recommendation. This is a good thing because that means that it doesn't pop up on people's front page. This is particularly important for people who say follow the frame rate police. They keep getting recommended games that are 30 FPS games, the kind of things that they wouldn't want on their front page. Now, we have the option to change that, but this is what you have to do. If you want to change your thumbs up, which was the default for like three years, to informational. I have to click, I have to then click edit, I have to then click informational, I have to click apply. I can't do this in batches, I have to do this for every single thing on the frame rate police curator. That would take a ton of time. Is it enjoyable to do? No. Now we come back to this idea that curation should be a fun, rewarding, and fulfilling experience for everybody to use. But it's not. It's a giant pain in the ass because the functionality is so threadbare and it is so poorly designed in that respect. These are one of many things that I want changing, and like I said, I'm sending them a massive list of things, but we talked about quite a few of these in the meeting, and they were not arguing with any of them. Of course, they realized that these were things that needed to be changed. Now, if you're considering becoming a curator, well, they want to make it, as I said, rewarding to do so. And they came up with some ideas. They came up with a level system for curators that would unlock various perks as you went through. Now, this ties into another major feature that they're currently developing that you haven't heard about yet, which I'm going to reveal for you right here. Valve is looking to integrate a key mailer system into Steam. Now, what this means is that developers will be able to give access to games to people directly within the Steam client without having to email them a key. This is unbelievably useful for a wide variety of reasons. But as a consumer, you might be saying, why the hell should I care about any of this? Well, there's a few benefits even for you as well, even if you don't decide to be a curator. A direct key mailer system which allows developers to get keys en masse into the hands of curators and people that actually want them is useful to you because those people can then turn around and say, hey, we found something new that's good that you didn't know about, here's why, and we discovered it because we were given access to it by the developer. That in itself is useful to you because that increases the quality of the things that you are seeing on the Steam page. Not only that, but it cracks down in a major way on Steam key fraud. Now, you might be aware that there are third-party grey market sites that deal in the sale of Steam keys. Quite a lot of these keys are acquired through credit card fraud, which is obviously illegal, but a decent amount of them are also acquired through social engineering. I'm hesitant to even talk about this because even mentioning it may cause more people to try and do it, but I think people are probably pretty aware of this practice by now, especially if you've been engaging in it. And it's quite a simple process. It involves impersonating a YouTuber or a Twitch streamer or indeed a reviewer from a website and going to a company and saying, Hey, I'm this person. I want to look at your game. Give me keys, please. And of course, a lot of developers really desperate for coverage, they're going to give it to them. They're going to say, yeah, absolutely, you should look at it. And then those keys end up on dodgy websites. There have been various efforts to solve this problem, including a number of fairly small key mailer and key distribution sites, but ultimately not that many companies use them. And most key distribution is still done the old fashioned way via email or through PR companies. The ability to do this via Steam curation 
and directly through the Steam client without the giving out of actual physical keys is a big deal for developers. It makes it much easier to get the games to the people who can provide you the coverage, but more importantly, get the games to the right people. More often than not, the strategy is just carpet bombing. Take a thousand keys, throw them out to every person you can, and hope for a few bites. Of course, what works out a lot better is when you get the game to a person that you know has an audience that are particularly interested in that kind of product. And they, being experts hopefully in that genre and that kind of product, are going to give you a more in-depth piece of coverage, something that's more useful. I've said it time and time again. If you want your game to be successful, don't throw it at PewDiePie. Don't throw it at a big Let's Player. Find a smaller channel that is dedicated and committed to that particular genre and shows a degree of expertise and give it to them. They can shift far more copies. They have an audience that is inherently interested in what you have to offer, whereas these channels may very well be huge, but they have a young audience that don't have a lot of disposable income and they're probably not interested in your grand forex strategy. Let's be frank about that. In its current mock-up form, the mailer system is tied into curators. It allows developers to mail keys directly to curators based on certain tags. So as a curator, I could set tags of things that I don't want. Psychological horror would be a good example. I don't look at horror games. Certain kinds of sports games would need to be able to use tags like American football or something along those lines, because if it was a game like Rocket League, yeah, I'd probably be interested in that. That's technically a sports game. So is Disc Jam. But Madden 2017 or Out of the Park Baseball, no, I wouldn't be interested in that. So there will be filters one way or the other, both for the people sending the keys out. They'll be able to see the preferences of the curator and the kind of games that they generally curate. And also on the curator's end to make sure they're not completely inundated with keys for games they don't care about. Because, of course, the top curators are going to get keys for everything. So you want to be able to filter that kind of thing out. Now, in the process, the developer's going to be able to provide a short elevator pitch trying to convince the person, look, you need to look at our game. I've given examples in the past of how I discovered various games and how they ended up on the channel. One example was Party Hard. The only reason I looked at Party Hard is because the PR guy sent me an email, and at the top of that email was a gift of a dancing bear in gold chains. That's the reason I looked at that. This shows the value of the so-called elevator pitch. If you're able to get somebody hooked in within the first few lines, then you may very well get yourself some coverage. So I made sure to say to them, look, if you're going to put this feature in, then you need to give people the ability to do that. Now, the system will also include some useful information such as screenshots and embargo dates for those who are doing YouTube stream and written coverage reviews and all that sort of thing. Now, this, as far as I'm concerned, is a big benefit to those of you considering starting up a curator or running a small curator. This is not really a big benefit to the guys who are already at the top. We can get code for pretty much anything we want outside of the occasional sticking point with the biggest of developers, the big publishers that we sometimes have mixed relations with. I don't expect them to really be using this system anyway. When it comes to indie games, they're knocking down our door to try and get coverage, and we can't provide it to the vast majority of people. What this is useful for is those of you that are running really small startup YouTube channels, Twitch streams, websites, all that kind of thing, and even those who are just wanting to curate just for fun. If you're able to build up a following, then you should have access to these sort of games the same way that we do. If you're able to influence the store and provide a service to people, you should be getting access to these games so that you can do your job, even if it happens to be a hobby. So what they're looking to do is tie access to this key mailer system into your activity as a curator. If you curate their store, you're going to be rewarded with access that you maybe didn't have previously, regardless of your size. As long as you're active and you're doing something to benefit the store, then you should be getting access to that. Of course, the developers get to choose who they send keys to, but being able to get access to games directly without having to build up a huge portfolio of PR contacts and establish your importance to all of these companies is, in my opinion, a massive benefit to those of you that would curate as a hobby or who are trying to start up a very small website, YouTube channel, or Twitch stream. Now, Valve wanted to make sure that curators that didn't review, that just provided information were also being rewarded for their efforts and being given access to this kind of thing if it would be helpful to them. Valve gave an example of a curator who 
lists games that have English fan subs and then links to said fan subs. There are also plenty of examples of curators that deal with foreign language access to games, how good a dub is, whether or not there are subs in a particular language, whether or not there are unofficial subs that you could download, that sort of thing. They want to make sure these guys are being rewarded as well, and I'm sure that being given access to games for free that they would otherwise have to buy is, again, a very useful thing for them. Plus, of course, there will be a bunch of other rewards that are not necessarily so tangible, but recognize the efforts of these people. They should at least be recognized for their work, right? And currently, they're not getting any recognition whatsoever. Valve wants to address that. I'm going to be involved heavily in these conversations going forward by the looks of it, and I want to make sure that the curator system is good for everybody, and that it's something that everybody can get involved in and get some sort of value out of. Obviously, it's beneficial to me. I would like more people to follow and use my curator. I want to know how influential my curator is. I want to be able to provide information to my followers on an easy to discover basis. I want to be able to group games together and do all that sort of thing. But ultimately, if we have a more healthy curator ecosystem with more curators that are more active and more Steam users that are using the curator system to figure out what game to get next, the better it is for everybody, including me. So I have a vested interest in helping out all of these curators, regardless of their size. Again, Valve views curators as pretty key to making sure that good games are getting attention, whereas bad games are invisible. And that's their strategy. It's been their strategy for a long time. They don't want to be the arbiters of what is a good game and what isn't. They don't want to be put in a situation where they're denying a game that may very well have an audience from finding that audience. They're actually really gun-shy. If you remember how it used to be, Valve used to heavily curate the Steam store and only let certain games onto it. Now, this was great for games that got on the store because usually they get a lot of attention and there was a certain level of quality that was to be expected from games that you bought on the store. So that was also good for consumers as well, because the chances are you are never ever going to buy something as terrible as The Slaughtering Grounds, because that game would never get on there to begin with. A lot of people, to some extent myself included, pine for those days, and the indie devs in particular that were involved in that early push, they really pined for it because they gained a huge amount of sales through that system. They didn't even have to market necessarily. Just being on the Steam store was marketing enough. That's no longer the case. Myself and Jim impressed upon Valve particularly that while we understand they don't want to cut off the legs of a game that might very well have an audience, and they also don't want to be seen as abusing their position in the market, let's say, for instance, there was a new MOBA on its way that looked like it could compete with Dota, well, they could potentially deny that game from getting onto the Steam page. I doubt that would happen, but there's always a possibility of it. So they never want to be seen as being in a position where that could happen. They're very cognizant of their position in the market. Regardless of all of that, we impressed upon them. Look, there are some games that are obviously worthless. They're never going to have an audience because they're asset flips. They're not even games. They're scams. They're simply used to either launder money or to mill trading cards. They're aware of these kind of games, and they actually put them into a third category. They don't call them bad games, they actually call them fake games. And with Steam Direct, they do want to bring the hammer down pretty hard on this by making sure that these games can't make any money. The motivation for the creation of most of these games is to make some sort of profit. Not a huge amount, necessarily, because you might be thinking, well, how do these games even make money? They don't make a lot, but the thing is they don't require a lot to be profitable. They're often milled out by a single person, sometimes in a day or less. You might think that's impossible, but no. You can acquire assets to build a whole game simply through the Unity Asset Store. You barely have to do anything. You only need a cursory knowledge of programming to make a game, add some trading cards to it, and throw it out for 99 cents. And you could do it a lot. This is even assuming that these guys are buying these assets from the store and not pirating them. I'm fairly sure that not every developer engaged in this asset flip practice, creating these so-called fake games, is buying their assets. No. So in reality, the cost of making these games is almost zero, and you can make some money 
Not a huge amount, but some money through trading cards, through the occasional dumb sale. And if you make enough of these games, yeah, you can make a living that way. They want to make this whole thing unprofitable. A lot of that's going to be down to who gets access to trading cards, whether or not it's going to be a minimum cost floor in order to gain access to trading cards, or you're going to have to shift a certain number of copies to gain access to trading cards. Well, that is still up for debate, but they are aware of the issue, and their approach to fixing it is to cut it off at the legs to make sure that those games can't be profitable so they can't survive within the Steam environment. You can't make a business model out of it. That seems like a fairly sensible long-term solution. They did also point out that they have a company that is doing some pretty basic QA. They're checking whether or not something has an EXE. They're checking whether or not it has a virus. They're checking whether it or not it actually loads. And indeed, whether or not it has a game within it. What they can't do, at least so they claim, is to identify asset flips. They don't have the experience and the knowledge to do it. They're kind of relying on curators to be able to spot that sort of thing. And they were unwilling to allow people to report those games for removal from the store. What they were more open to is providing a set of rules which developers have to follow under the Steam Direct system to get their game onto Steam through Steam Direct and yes, they are willing to punish them for violating those rules and potentially remove them from the store page as a result. We're talking about developers that are inherently abusive when it comes to copyright law, for instance. If it becomes obvious that a developer is taking down criticism on third-party websites by abusing copyright law, if they're trying to make trademark cases against videos, as happened recently with Airport Master, if they're being readily abusive, or of course if they're going as far as Digital Homicide did when it came to harassing reviewers and people that said bad things about their game, then yes, they are considering stopping doing business with them. They seemed quite cagey about this. I don't necessarily blame them for being cagey about it, but myself and Jim said this straight to their face. We said, look, these people are your business partners, whether you like it or not. They're on your platform, you're taking money from their sales, you are providing them access to the user base that you have cultivated. They are your business partners, and if your business partners behave badly, it does reflect upon you as a company. And they did seem willing to accept that, and needless to say, they reassured us, no, of course we don't want these people on our platform. We're just having difficulty drawing the line between being overbearing and abusive as the owners of the Steam platform and properly policing it to ensure that we don't have these flagrant abuses going on. So those of you that wondered whether or not my statement that Valve should get directly involved with the whole fake DMCA thing was just a pie in the sky idea, I didn't say that out of nowhere. I had a belief that they may very well go in that direction if given the right sort of explanation and motivation for it. Of course, they've just got to be careful about not overstepping. Like I said, I don't know how far they're going to go with that. They showed no specific plans in regards to those abusive developers, but the fact that they did bring them up and they brought up the concept of the fake game and expressed their desire to make such games so unprofitable that they wouldn't be made and put on the Steam platform anymore, at least showed some form of progressive thinking in that regard they are moving towards trying to solve that problem. When it comes to bad games, a lot of that of course is subjective, but they're hoping that improved discovery and improved curation will make sure that you don't see them. And if you are going out of your way to play those kind of things, they're not going to be banned from the store. You'll still be able to find them. We don't want to, as content creators, as critics, dictate what games you can play. If you want to play stuff like Bloody Boobs, then, you know, you're welcome to do so. It is still a game. We're trying to distinguish between what is a game and what is made for the sole purpose of milling trading cards and laundering money. Those are two very, very different things. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about before we reach a conclusion on what's going on is the Steam support system. They told us over the last couple of years they have hired two external companies to provide the vast majority of frontline support. This is something they didn't used to have. Now, combined with the refund system, they believe that these tickets are being answered in a reasonable fashion at reasonable speeds, and those that do have problems can often just solve it by using the automated refund system. 
They have a division within Valve, and I saw it. It existed. It's real. There were people there. They were answering tickets that deal with the stuff that these third-party outsourced companies can't deal with. They exist. They're continuing to improve this sort of thing. I honestly haven't had a reason to use the support system lately, so I don't even know what state it's currently in. You guys would know way more about that than I would, but they have stated that they have this infrastructure in place and they're looking to improve it. And through making the Steam store a better place, through hopefully selling more good games and selling less bad games, Steam support will be less important as we go forward. It's not a reason for them to dodge having good support. I'm hoping these third-party companies do their job properly. I don't know. I'm sure I'll hear a lot about it over the next few days on forums as people say, well, I submitted a ticket three weeks ago and it hasn't been answered yet. And if that's true, then yeah, they need to get their asses in gear in that regard. As I said, it's hard for me to discuss it because I just don't use the system. But they at least did bring it up and they do seem to be doing something about it. So, a roundup and conclusion. A reminder of everything we've talked about and my conclusion on the effectiveness of that meeting and their intent going forward. They're going to give transparent access to data to pretty much anybody that wants it. You will know exactly why you landed on a particular game page. You will know why the recommendation engine is giving you the recommendations that it is. And you will also know whether or not these terrible games are getting more attention than they deserve and why it is that good games are not getting the attention that you do believe that they deserve. In combination with that, they will introduce a system called Explorers, which allows people to find these hidden gems and give a second chance to games that perhaps deserve it, but didn't get the attention that they should have gotten over the first couple of weeks of launch. Those curators will be rewarded in both tangible and intangible ways for providing this information and will have access to a community of like-minded individuals, which will hopefully be a fulfilling and satisfying experience for those that choose to take on that particular role. Curators will also be given increased functionality and influence. The backend issues will be fixed. The curator page will be made a much more useful place for the consumer as well as the curator itself and various changes to the Steam Store to encourage people to use curators and sign up and follow curators that they would find useful. Now, of course, if you don't want to, again, you're not going to be forced to, and you will be able to completely ignore that. You will be able to opt out if you wish. On the extreme flip side of that, you will eventually be able to have an entire Steam Store that is solely consisting of games that your various curators recommended. You could block anything else out. You can have an entire Steam store that is only those games if you want to. That's something they're looking into doing. More customization, more personalization of your front page and your Steam client. And that hopefully applies across the board to a bunch of different things that people want to see or don't want to see. The key mailer system is going to be tied into that curator system and will be useful for curators and, of course, for indie devs to get their keys to the right places. It will hopefully have a severe impact on key fraud and do damage to those illegitimate websites that are selling dodgy keys. It will, from a consumer perspective, hopefully make your Steam store a better place because these games are getting out to more people and those people are therefore able to either recommend them to you or tell them that they're not worth your time you should hopefully eventually be in a position where these games don't slip under the radar for you. That it is very easy to find them because they have been given to the right people and they are getting the exposure that they deserve, which translates into increased visibility in your Steam client so you can more easily find those games that you will enjoy. This in turn will hopefully further bury terrible games that you don't want to see and Steam is taking measures to make the profitability of so-called fake games non-existent. So they will hopefully just not get through the Steam Direct system at all. Developers that are readily abusive to both their customers and reviewers are running the risk of having Valve ceasing relations with them, and there will of course be terms and conditions in the Steam Direct system that these companies are going to have to agree to. As to whether Valve continues to apply a very light touch with these devs, that remains to be seen, so we may very well not see that have much of an impact at all. But it's on their radar, they've been made aware of it, and will hopefully take action. 
So, what's my conclusion on this whole thing? Well, I feel that the data is going to be very useful in determining what Valve is currently doing right and what Valve is currently doing wrong. It's also going to have a direct influence on the overall conversation. If that data is out there in its raw form and is available, then speculation will be less rife and we'll be able to make more accurate criticisms of the platform, which will hopefully then result in things that need to be fixed actually being fixed. If we are overstating or understating a problem, it will be much easier to find that out simply through analysis of this data. That hopefully means that things that are important will be prioritized and things that are not will receive less attention. This should be a good thing for consumers overall when it comes to how good the Steam platform is and how usable it happens to be. I think that data-driven approach is a long-term practical solution to quite a few of the problems that we have about the quality of the Steam library, but in the interim, I still want them to intervene in certain cases where it's obvious that a game is a blatant ripoff, an asset flip, not even a game at all, infringing on people's copyright and intellectual property. These are the sort of things that I want Valve to be stepping in on. They don't have to do that the vast majority of the time, but there are certain instances where they should, and it seems like they have to be pushed to an extraordinary extent to get involved in anything. It took Digital Homicide subpoenaing Valve themselves for customer information for Valve to decide to stop doing business with them. I can only think of a handful of instances over the past couple of years where a dev has pushed so many buttons that they have received punishment. I mean, for God's sake, one of them involved an actual death threat towards Gabe Newell. That's apparently how far you have to go to get Valve to stop doing business with you. I think they should be more selective and frankly they have a market responsibility to make sure that they're doing business with people who aren't bad actors, who aren't straight up crooks in certain situations. I hope their pushback against fake games and their attempt to make them completely unprofitable and essentially salt the earth so that they can't grow anymore will work. I hope so, it's hard to say. We haven't seen it in action yet, so at least they're aware of the problem and they are doing something to resolve it. Obviously, from my position, upgrading the role of curators and making sure they have the functionality they need and they're encouraged and incentivized to do their job is a good thing. But of course, I'm a curator. I'm going to say that. I do believe that the curation system is valuable and it's taking something that's already happening on third-party sites and on YouTube and Twitch and putting it directly into Steam in a way that's easy to see and access. Naturally, I'm going to be very biased in favor of curators having more influence, whereas some other people are terrified of that notion. Well, the reality is that a lot of these curators have influence outside of Steam anyway, so it's not as if they're simply being given power for no reason. People are following them, people are paying attention to what they have to say, so they should be in a position where they can easily influence those people and give them the information that they're asking for, that they're going out of their way to look for. It's not as if you're being bombarded by these curator recommendations if you're not following any curators. Indeed, you're not getting any at all, which as far as I'm concerned is actually going far too far to the other extreme. The solution to that, of course, is just encourage more people to use curators. Don't use the stick, use the carrot. Make it a more useful system. Incentivize people to use it. Because let's be honest, we are kind of doing Valve's job for them to some extent. On a certain level, if you agree that Valve in itself is also a curator of content, which I do believe that they are, even if they try and avoid being one, yes, those people should be rewarded. We shouldn't be doing that job for free. And this also applies to this whole explorer idea. I think the idea itself is sound. It's important that these explorers are properly rewarded for doing a job, especially when they're not just risking time, they're also spending money to do so. Of course, that one grace refund a week is helpful, no doubt, but if you want to really dig in there, you're going to be risking some money sometimes. You know, you might play a game for more than a couple of hours and it's like, well, I used my one grace refund for the week, so I actually ended up wasting money on this title. I'm out money and I'm doing what's at this point now a job and a service. I should be rewarded for that. You're damn right they should be rewarded for that. So I'm hoping that they design this system in such a way that it is fulfilling and rewarding. It's not going to be for everybody, there's no doubt. It's going to be for a certain class of people, and that's okay. That's probably for the best. We don't want 
a situation where people are just messing around and doing the bare minimum for free games. That would be a hindrance rather than a help. It would end up poisoning the recommendation system. But I think the idea is sound enough as long as they implement it properly. I think what would also be nice with that system is to tie it into key mailers, maybe allow developers to release a certain number of keys for explorers to use. And occasionally as you explore, it's like, hey, this uh, developer wants to offer you this for free. You want to have a look at it? All that kind of thing. You could easily do that within the system and hell, have it be completely anonymous so there's no influence being applied there. That would be another way to get some of these hidden gems out from under the pile of other stuff and make sure that you as the consumer are seeing the games that you want to see. That pretty much covers all the meetings. You know, we had about six or seven hours of meetings. I've tried to distill that into an hour of discussion for you. I was left with the impression that this is going to be an ongoing thing. They'll come back to us for more information later. We probably will not be the only people that they ask. Don't worry, Steam's future is not just in the hand of Total Biscuit and Jim Sterling. That would be ridiculous. They will be taking consultation from hopefully a wide group of people. But... The fact that they showed us these mock-ups, showed us these systems, let us talk about them publicly indicates that they are going down this route. This is not just pie in the sky. If it were, why would they let us talk about it? Why would they let us hold them to that? If they came up with a bunch of mock-ups and then decided, lol, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to trick you. Ha ha ha. That is dumb. That's astonishingly stupid. What do they hope to accomplish that way? I understand there's a degree of skepticism from people. There was a degree of skepticism from me going into the meeting. I am very, very cautious about visiting studios. I barely ever do it, mostly because a lot of it's a waste of time. But ultimately, I spent seven hours in a meeting room, not being dragged around, being shown a bunch of fancy things and being treated to fancy meals and wine and all sorts of other nonsense. No, this was a business meeting. They were there to get our ideas and our consultation on upcoming features and we gave it to the best of our ability. And a lot of this looks good. It's very much the Valve way, I guess. Creating systems and automation to solve problems, trying to take a lot of the human factor out of it. That's really a business strategy that a small company has followed for a number of years now and has for the most part been successful, but has left some gaping holes and very justifiable criticism at their feet, especially when it comes to things like support and the ineffectiveness and half ass nature of some features. I'm hoping that they will continue to improve these features and plug these holes and actually fix these systems. If they don't, of course, then you know, nothing will change. They will continue to be in a position of market dominance with a audience that begrudgingly lets them have it and is being denied things that they need as consumers to make good decisions. I'm hoping that it's in their best interests to make sure that that is not the case and to increase consumer confidence in their store system as well as make sure that the devs that deserve it are getting the attention that they need to succeed. This is a market that is now flooded with games more so than any other time in history and it's more important than ever that the good stuff, the cream, is able to rise to the top. I was, for the most part, pleased with what I saw. They seemed like they were very open and honest about everything. This commitment to transparency, I think, is a big deal for a company that has traditionally been very closed off when it comes to that kind of information. I think that's going to be very helpful going forward, and I'm hoping that they continue to take consultation from specialists and people that do use these systems and know an awful lot about them, as well as have a keen awareness of their flaws and shortcomings. The fact that we were dealing with Robin Walker and senior Valve folks is indicative that they're taking this seriously and that they're not simply looking to give people the runaround. I believe that their intentions are honest, from what I can tell. They seem to be acting in good faith. Now, of course, it is left up to them to implement these systems in a way that is useful to the consumer and to those who are curating their store and doing a job that frankly, should be done internally, but they insist on crowdsourcing out to people outside of the company. If you're going to do that, at least make it worthwhile and make sure that we have the tools to do it properly. There we go, folks. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If not, the dislike button is right over there, and I'll see you next time.